welcome Ken Kaufman, CFO of Community Dental Partners and National Dental Partners. Uh, so Ken, welcome. We are live inside the DSO Secrets uh, Facebook groups. So you want to say hello? Uh, yeah. Hey, thanks so much, Jake, for having me with you. And it's, it's awesome to be here with the DSO Secrets group. I, I love this tribe of people who are trying to figure this space out and figure out how to bring value every day. Yeah, awesome. And so it's it's really such a such a great group. You know, I'll log, I'll like forget to log in one day and I'll log in. I say just like comments and everyone's like chiming in and um yeah, it's it's really cool. And and so that's we got a good thing going there. Um so Ken, you want to give everyone, those of you that might not know you, um, a little bit about you know who you are, what you do. It's just a quick introduction there. Yeah, you bet. So I did the school thing, undergrad in business, um, and did an MBA in finance and entrepreneurship. Uh, I've been the CFO or CFO president of the organizations I've been a part of since 2004. Um, I joined uh, CDP, NDP uh, at the beginning of 2016. So we're, we're, we passed the five year anniversary. Um, many of you know Emmett Scott, he and I have known each other and been working on projects and doing different things since 2006. Um, and uh, we, we were finally able to get married up full time, both of us in the same organization. and. It's, uh, it's been an awesome ride and I, I absolutely love dental. I love the space. I used to be the president CFO of the Nomad business and consulted some other different deals. And so I, uh, anyways, I, that, that's a little bit about my background. I, I love being in dental and especially in, in the DSO space where we get to support amazing clinicians. Awesome. So we're going to do an ask me anything. If you have some questions underneath, we'll do a few announcements. But uh, yeah, Ken is, is CFO, but you know, I'd say Ken, you have a unique ability to really translate uh, CFO wordery into uh, some phrases and, and things that we can all understand. So I think that's amazing about you. And um, and those of you that are going to be on the live event circuit in the next you know twelve months or twenty four months, you'll see Ken around as well. He's always around and, and approachable and, and always there to help. So. I will, I will I will let everyone know, Ken, we kind of announced this a few weeks ago, but, you know, I think it's worth talking about again. Um, you know, I'm actually lucky enough to be working with you now. So um, as some of you all know, um, the DEO actually acquired DSO Secrets. Um, so we've brought on Emmett Scott and Ken Kaufman. My name is Jake Poole. I'm with uh, a CEO of the Dentist Entrepreneur Organization. So we brought on Emmett and Ken uh, on the board of advisors. So Ken, we've been out working together uh, for a while now, and it's been an absolute pleasure, and um, I'm just so grateful to, to have you uh, on the team here, and and yeah, anything you want to say about the the partnership? Yeah, it, it's incredible. It really started uh, back right, right at the COVID time, and Emmett and I were producing massive amounts of content because there were so many questions and so many issues going on, and we were trying to learn them and then share what we learned as quickly as we could, and not that we were trying to be ahead of anybody, but just we we felt that urge to do it. And and the DEO, you know, Jake, you and your team just jumped in and took over the whole back end for that podcast and completely facilitated it. And and of course, Emmett had been a faculty member and things like that in in, in the past, uh, you know, or prior to that, leading up to that. But it just it just made so much sense to to bring all of that together, and and it's just created so much momentum. It's been fantastic. Yes, it's been fun and a match made in heaven. And we're, we've got some great, you know, kind of large plans this year, which we're excited to roll out. So, so let's get into it, Ken. You know, one, one thing I love about you, you've been around for a while here in the dental space. And so you've kind of touched on virtually, you know, most things inside of a dental group and a dental practice, not just the financial part. So um, I'm going to answer a few questions. Yeah, I'm going to ask you a few questions uh, from, from the group that have been posted. And then if you're watching this, this is a unique time. We've got Ken on the call here. Post your questions. Um, you know, we can get as tactical and as nitty gritty if you'd like. Ken, Ken has a lot of uh, experience with a lot of these things. So Ken, first question comes from Sarah. And uh, this is a question that was posted below in the group. Uh, I was wondering what kind of bonus structures do you all have for your regional office manager to incentivize them to look over all of the practices? So let's talk, talk uh, regional managers, Ken. What, what do you think? Yeah, you bet. So when we think about bonuses, the first thing you have to think about is how are you going to fund it? And then the second thing you have to think about is what are the measurements that those individuals have or the metrics that they have the most control over that will drive the best potential outcomes for the business. Um, and so every time we approach, and so I'm starting at a mindset level here, Jake, and then we'll, we'll layer down into the regionals, but how, how is the organization gonna pay for it? Um, and then what, what are the specific things that you want them to focus on that are gonna help drive the best potential outcomes? And so when you think about regional managers, 
you really want to focus on the uh, the success that's occurring in the practices that they're overseeing. And the primary way that you can measure that success is uh, some type of a profitability measurement. So you can have, you can look at revenue, you can look at gross production, and then all your reductions down to your net revenue, you can go all the way down through the P&L. But ultimately, you want your regional managers to understand that P&L and, and feel some ownership for helping the practices be profitable. Now, obviously, these are non-clinicians, and I need to be super clear on this. They are, the regionals do not get involved unless they're a, a, a regional director that is a clinician, which those aren't super common in the space. Um, the clinicians have their autonomy and as business people or as regionals, we can't step in and, and advise on anything around who should be treated or who should be diagnosed or what should be diagnosed. Those are things that, that stay with the clinician, but there are so many other ways that the DSO can show up and support so that that clinician can be as successful as possible with those patients. And so the first thing when we set up a regional bonus, uh, uh, bonus uh, structure is we are looking at having them feel some co-ownership of the profitability of the practices that they oversee. So if there are over five practices or 10 practices, you can sh look at that number and then put in their mind that you're responsible to help us hit. And here's the key thing, Jake, it's not hit that number, it's hit a number that's slightly above that, that if the pro practices can be that profitable, that is how ultimately they can receive their bonus or how they fund their bonus. So set your goals for the year, not the aggressive, hey, we're gonna take over the world, world goals, but it's kind of a base budget. And then you bump that up a little bit and say, if you can help us get here, that's gonna fund your bonus. And then and there's, there's a second component, but I wanna stop there, Jake, so you can ask a couple of questions or if there's questions from the group. No, it's beautiful. I think the, the first principle is bonus on improvements. Um, and, and so it's almost like there's a baseline, um, which makes which makes sense of sense. So yeah, I mean, keep going. I think that's beautiful. Yeah. Well, and, and we think of the base budget really, or this concept of a base um, as, hey, this means we all are employed and we all get to continue to work and help. We need to be growing and we need to be helping the practices grow and help each other grow and organizations grow. Mm -hmm. And so it's that little bit of step up. And uh, you need to organize out your financials so that your regional managers can clearly see, hey, here's my practices and here's the consolidated profitability target and, and the lift I need to create in order to earn my potential bonus. And, and um, I'll say, Ken, I mean, something you all are, are masterful at is, is the communication of this. The communication of these things is everything, it, you know, because you really got to communicate, you got to dig deep into the reasons why you're doing things. Um, and just communicate in a way that they understand why you're doing them, why it's best for everyone. So um, just the way you talked about that, that was that was uh, really nice. And then you said that the, the regional needs to understand the PNL. Are you doing ongoing trainings like to get them? Uh, how, how, what does that look like? Yep. Um, so, so there's training, but we actually have our regional managers involved in the budgeting and planning process. Uh, for each of the practices. Now we have other stakeholders, like for example, our, our marketing team is gonna look and say, hey, how do we feel about the patient flow we can generate? The clinical team is gonna look and say, hey, what opportunities with the patient types that are coming in do we feel like we have? And, and we feel like um, we, could, we could set some goals around uh, from you know, just that clinical perspective and what they wanna accomplish. And you kind of take that and marry that up and you sit with the regionals and you go through and then they have the ability to take a look and, well, here's what staff compensation is going to be. And is that realistic? Where was it last year? Where is it, is, is it trending, you know, one direction or another? Is the practice growing or shrinking? There's a lot of things that go there, but we get them involved as a stakeholder, not that they would have full veto power, um, but they would have, they have a say in, in essence, what the targets are going to be for the year um, that, and, and what that stretch goal is going to be. Beautiful. And you're trying to avoid this kind of top down, like, uh, you know, here's your number and oh, good luck. You know, it's really getting them involved and, because uh, the last thing you want to do is is present numbers that are, are seem to the to the team member uh, unattainable, right? And then you just completely check out right from the beginning. Yeah, that's right. And and what you want to what you really want to do is you want to encourage them to start to think creatively about what can I do? Because the reality is at the DSO ivory tower level, those are the absolute worst people to be thinking about. Hey, what can we change or what programs would could we, could we implement in a practice to make it more successful? And so to the degree the regionals would be the closest other than you know, getting to the practice manager and some of the practice staff and, and the doctor and getting feedback from those folks, the regional represents sort of the closest to the practice 
and have the ability to really understand, well, I have labor problems here, or I have, um, we had some supply problems here. I'm going to get that corrected this year. We're going to set some budgets up with the team. I'm going to make sure my practice manager is trained so that when things slow down toward the end of the day to go ahead and send one or two staff members home to keep that keep the labor costs under control and make sure that they're not getting overtime during the week. And there's a lot of those little levers and knobs that if you allow the regionals to understand how the whole model works, they can get super creative. And we have somebody in our organization, they say, can it does not matter. This is what she says to me. It does not matter what is happening even like there could be earthquakes, there could be all these, there is always something to do within a region. There's always mm -hmm. something that you, that uh, if, if you give room for people to be creative and innovative and to think, think this through and understand how they can have a positive impact, there's always something that can be done. Love it. So, so there's some amazing information on, on bonuses and bonus structures, uh, you know, and, and really, yeah, go for it. If you got one, yeah. I just throw one other thing. So then Besides hitting that number, there are some key, what we feel like are key things that regionals have the most ability to impact. Um, one of them is turnover rate in the practice. And they work with their practice managers and make sure we're hiring the right people to start and then we're doing the right things to retain them and keep them engaged as employees. Because we all know when an employee walks out the door, a wealth of knowledge goes out the door and starting over again feels painful and it really helps the regional manager and the practice manager really own their hiring and own their onboarding and retention from a mentality standpoint. Now you want to support, you know, your support team should be supporting them, not expecting them to just do it all, but everything should be designed around that. And so we have the ability besides just hitting the number is you can earn your bonus if you keep your turnover numbers at or below a certain level, which means empl employees are engaged, they're happy. Another one is, and I've said this I think I probably say this about every time I ever do a presentation for the DEO or I'm involved in anything, the gross production to net revenue, it, there is massive opportunity to have influence there. Generally speaking, and I'm not talking UCR numbers, I'm talking contract, contracted insurance rates. There is so much room. You, usually you're losing 10 to 15 cents on the dollar um, on every dollar that you're billing uh, because we're missing opportunities. We're you know, we're not understanding uh, frequencies of x-rays that can be taken. We're not understanding, you know, uh, pre-authorization requirements and so on and so forth. And so there's a ton of opportunity between gross to net that regionals working with practice managers can have a ton of influence over. And keeping an extra one to two percent between your gross to net, um, keeping an extra one to two percent can can mean like a hundred thousand dollars of extra profitability. Um, or I'm sorry, ten thousand, twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars of extra profitability in a practice for the year, and that that makes a big difference. So there there are metrics that we have that say, hey, let's look at turnover, let's watch the gross to net reductions, and then there are a couple of others. And and I don't want to over -pre prescribe this, but you can think about what are some metrics that you want to track and say, hey you can earn a little bit more of a bonus or you earn your bonus if you hit two of your three metrics. And if you hit the third one, then there might be a little bit more there for you because you know that they're creating some great outcomes in the practice. And it's it's the things that they really truly have the most ability to influence and to, to change. Yeah, yeah. So I wanna ask you about uh, administering that by the way, but before that, um, so um, one thing that I think was amazing about this is the idea that, um, well, let's just talk about administering it. So, so what about administering it? Like, does it become burdensome or, cause I, we've had some DEO members who have gone through and, and, you know, done this and it's, it's all right for a year, but that when the end of the year comes, it's an administrative nightmare for them. So how do you think about this, especially as a small growing group? Yeah, we, we start with the end in mind when we do these things. And so we purposefully say, okay, what's it going to take to do this? And we try to, you know, simplify it down as much as possible. Um, I can tell you that there are a couple, a, a couple of metrics for with, that we tied to regional bonus that we haven't even officially implemented with them yet because we're still figuring out how do we simplify like turnover at the at, per practice, uh, some some of those ratios that we're still figuring out how to pull data and how to organize the right way. Otherwise, yeah, you could spend a ton of time, um, you know, chasing that information down. I will say one thing you said waiting till the end of the year with regional specifically we feel like quarterly is the right interval monthly like there's too much lumpiness month to month that i made i earned it i didn't 
going to quarterly seems to, but, but waiting till the end of the year, that seems a little too long and the, the carrots totally. are too far out there. Yeah. And so we we feel like that the right area is, is right about quarterly. Yeah, this is just such a great discussion. And then what I was going to point out before is, um, you know, another really, really point, important point is there's a lot of folks that are really interested in benchmarking, right? Like, what should my P&L look like? What should my percentages look like? And, and that's, you know, we've experienced that to be totally fine. And, and there's, there's value in, in looking at that. But really, you know, one of the DSO secrets is like, it's not about benchmarking against others. It's really about benchmarking against your own self. Um, because that's what a team can latch on to. Uh, you go into your team and say, you know, our supply costs need to be at this level because I was just at a, a seminar at a DEO event and that's what they said. Um, that doesn't go over nearly as well as like, hey guys and gals, let's see if we can improve uh, our supply cost uh, savings by, you know, half a percent this year. Yeah. Like that's, you know, that's kind of more, uh, and D Fisher says gloves the quarterly idea on, uh, on bonuses as well. Awesome. D is a rock star. He's such a rock star. She is so great. Another, another great one, uh, DEO faculty. D, good to see you out there. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm going to plug it. Can we got, well, let's do one more question because that was a great question on bonuses and we'll see if we can get to that. We're going to go, um, next question is uh, how, for those who have done practice merger and chart sales, what are some of the strategies to maximize number of patients who actually come to a new location? But before that, I want to, I want to give a little plug, Ken, because uh, you on the on the uh, board of advisors for DEO. Um, those of you know that DEO is a we're a, a peer training organization where we bring in experts and peers and and we help uh, dentist entrepreneurs and their executives kind of make it to that next level. Whether it be going from that you know one and a half million to that five million, that five to that ten or twenty million, even even to that fifty million. Um, you know we use peer peer training and experts and in, in, um, uh, to to really you know learn from. And so Ken, you're coming into one of our events here in two weeks where we're meeting with those folks in our immersion group, which is that 1.5 to 5 million. We're trying to get everyone up to that 5 million. And uh, you're going to be presenting on associate pay models. So I'm going to give a little teaser here because it's really cool. This is just hot off the press like 20 minutes ago. But Ken, you haven't even seen this yet, but this is what you're going to go over. Uh, You've got your five, uh, so associate pay models, and you've broken it down into five different uh, types. So I don't know if you want to Talk just a little bit about this, tease us a little bit, but it's very, very cool that you've gone down it. And you're going to be teaching all DO members this in just a few weeks. So there's still time to sign up if you're interested in something like this. Yep. Yeah, so th- this is going to be fun. And I appreciate uh, all the help and assistance I've had uh, preparing this and putting it together. Um, this is going to be a lot of fun. And actually, Dr. Maya Martin is going to be joining and talking about some of her journey in the process of figuring out what her compensation model should be for associates and very, very successful group of practices in North Carolina. Um, so there's, there's basically five, com- five different models and based on the types of associates that you want to attract and how you want to set up your organization, you can take the, take these models and then figure out which one applies to you. Um, and, and what applies to, to your practice. We're going to try to keep it super practical, roll up our shirt sleeves and, and give you some real practical, uh, tips and tricks on how to set up a compensation program. It's amazing because, you know, they're, they're really when, you know, folks used to say it doesn't, we don't say anymore, but if you've seen one DSO, you've seen one DSO and, you know, we're trying to take that to the next level and say, look, there actually is a probably a, a finite number of ways you can look at these things. And really it's about knowing yourself what kind of business you want to have and then choosing the right one. So that's what we've done here is broken this down into your five finite options and, uh, and giving you the tools uh, to do that. So there's still time if you're interested in, in joining the DEO uh, program and in, in attending this with Ken, that's, uh, there's still time. So just wanted to give you a cool plug there, Ken, because it looks like you spent a lot of time on that. So, um, all right, last question here. Um, Drew Jordan says, for those of you who have done practice mergers, uh, practice mergers and chart sales, what are some of the strategies for maximizing the number of patients who actually come to the new location? So Ken, what are your thoughts on mergers and chart sales? So. I actually have a lot of questions for Drew here on this one. Um, I, I, I want him to think a little bit deeper uh, before I would go there. My first question is, okay, who are these patients? What, what avatar do they fit in? Um, what services are you offering that you think are the most attractive to them? What types of marketing does that avatar specifically respond to? Is it, is it billboards? Is it phone calls? Is it mailers? Is it community outreach? Is it, I mean, we could, is it digital? There, there's so many different mediums to go at. Um, honestly, I would, I would go through and profile those patient charts and I would try to find what your trends are and then build a marketing program specifically to them that is appealing to them. Mm-hmm. And so, it, th- but the thing, this is a mindset thing that's hard work. You got to really dig in and understand what are you offering that other competitors aren't? What's different about you? And that's going to be so attractive to these patients that's going to just compel them 
to be excited about coming to your practice. And that, I, I, that I'm sure that's not the, the silver bullet that Drew was looking. Well, for. let's let's um let's talk about you know is there is there a communication that you sent out um you know it, to the patient to you know patients as you come in or you know anything like that? Like there's usually a letter or some kind of communication that you're teaching the team. Anything that you've come across there? Yeah, definitely. And I think I think the key thing around the entire um, process. So yeah, definitely you want to send um, send a letter. Uh, there, I believe I don't know all the rules around this, but I think there's some clinical responsibility about if if the other clinician is retiring or moving moving out of the business and and they're officially handing the patients over. So again, talk to your compliance officer and and they can help you figure the 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 right legal ways and compliant ways to do those things. But from the marketing side, absolutely a beautiful letter, an endorsement from whoever the prior provider was, um, explaining why they think this practice is going to take great care of the patients and and framing it in a way that's going to be meaningful to the patients and and the thing is like you, you could say like you come to the do and say hey i want i want a letter like i want a form letter for this this, this cannot be a form letter this has to come from the heart it has to be authentic um and the the patients are gonna they have a desire to connect with you and then everyone who touches that patient in any way if you have a call somebody calling or texting or those sorts of things we like to help train our team because, you know, the doctor that's going to be receiving these patients, they're excited about it. They're like, hey, I, I really want to take care of these patients. And so we try to help our staff think about communicating that to the patient. Hey, Dr. Smith is really excited to meet you and is really excited to have you come in for a visit and wants to make sure we're taking care of all your dental needs. Those types of just little things they calm people down and they help them feel comfortable. And so those are, maybe those are a few little tips and tricks you can think about. Just do things to really, because nobody likes change. And so just do lots of things to help those patients feel comfortable and confident and moving forward. Yeah, the way, you know, the way I look at those kind of things is there's only a, a certain number of ways you can get in contact with a patient. I mean, there's, like you said, like text, email, call, you can have posters. There's probably 15, 20 different ways you can get a piece of information. Hey, you know, we need you to come back in or we just bought this new under new ownership, all those kind of things. So it's about, you know, taking those different 15, 20 different ways. And then, like you said, ranking them, customizing them toward the patient avatar that, that in a way that they would want to hear that. It sounds like is what you're saying. D yep. says um, you buy the philosophy of the old practice. So yeah, I mean, absolutely. Any thoughts on that? I mean, you're, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're doing this and you're, you're kind of purchasing those charts or merging, it's really about, yeah, it's really about the brand and the philosophy that those, you know, that practice and clinicians had before you know, well, yeah, if you think about it, there's a reason why those patients were attracted to that practice initially and, and that clinician and to whatever the, the service model was that was being offered. And so there's, uh, there's likely a reason why there's this collected group together. Um, and as much as you can drive that into the, le that, that legacy into the mentality and the philosophy is it, it, it's going to make a big difference, but again, it has to be authentic too. It's got, it, it's got to be real because People can just read through that so easily. Awesome. All right. Uh, Mahail, I think, uh, asked one question. We'll get it in. This will be over time, uh, which we're happy to do. So Mahail says, um, do you implement membership plans for patients without insurances? If yes, how successful the program is technically wise, do you run it internally or externally through a third party? Um, so we, I'll start with that last question. We run this um, externally um, because in a lot of states, there are specific rules about offering any type of a membership plan related to healthcare. And you have to be um, registered with the insurance uh, commission in the state. And there's a bunch of report, reporting requirements, audits, and so on and so forth. And so we do rely on another party that has kind of jumped through those hoops and solved all those things already. Um, jumping back to the beginning of the question, we do make it available. Um, our, in, in a lot of our practices, we, we don't have that many cash paying patients. Uh, we do a lot of Medicaid children um, and or we, our, our clinicians service that, that base uh, significantly. Um, and then some PPO insurance and then some cash paying patients or fee for service. Um, but we, we do make that available and we, we do a, a share of the fee with the clinician. So they've got some stake in the game because if you're giving things away for free on your membership program, <laughs> Um, and then the doctor's not getting paid and, and sometimes that can cause some misalignment. So we gave that to our clinical executive committee and they, they designed the program a way that they felt comfortable and they felt like it was going to be fair to them. And uh, that was one thing where the DSO could not get in the way of that. That needed to be them deciding, figuring it out. They brought it back to us. A few, few tweaks that were just administrative. 
Um, and uh, we absolutely offer that. And because we feel like, um, you know, a lot of people are calling doing price shopping, but we want to give our patients a path, especially to get out of pain if they're in pain. And so that limited exam um, and getting out of pain, it, those are some, there's some really nice benefits associated with, uh, depending on how you set up your membership plan. Awesome. Mihail uh, says, thank you. And I hope I, got to, hopefully I got that right. Sorry if I did not. And uh, yeah, so Ken, awesome. It's always nice to jump on here. We like to jump in, you know, once every couple of weeks and just do a quick little ask me anything with you and Emmett and other experts. Uh, you know, if D's in here, we should get D in here. Maybe a team, we'll, we'll see if we can get D in here next couple months too. So uh, anything, any parting words? Um, we're going into the rest of the year, Ken. We're, we have a live event inside the DEO membership uh, in April, which we're excited about uh, for our DEO elite members. Um, and then I think, I think in, in Dallas, there's going to be a live event, uh, Kaleo and Dykema is going to have a live event in July. So we're going to start seeing each other, I think. Yeah, that's right. F face to face. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, my, you know, my parting words are, this is just, it's such a fun time in this industry. It's such an amazing space to be in. Um, it's hard. Uh, everybody would be here otherwise. Um, and, uh, you know, all the private equity folks would figure out how to do it themselves. Instead, they need good management teams and good leadership teams and good platforms to partner with and, and to help, um, help drive, you know, that part of their business. But th it is such an exciting time uh, to be in the space. And, and um, I just, I'm just excited. There's so much opportunity yeah. in this industry. It is just so wide open. If you show up and you you figure out how to serve doctors who care about their patients, sky's the limit. Awesome. Getting lots of thanks. Uh, Eric, uh, Marianne, uh, Nathan Harsh, uh, Brown Chitty says, oh, thank you. So um, yeah, awesome, Ken. It was enjoyable. Love it. I always love talking to you. So thanks so much for dropping in with us. Awesome. Thanks, Jake. It's been awesome. All right. See you, everybody.